All right. In theory, we're live. But who knows? The, the joke we always make is, is we require some kind of external validation to collapse the, the wave front here. Into, uh, into, yeah, I was going to say, I yeah. feel like Schrodinger's cat. Yeah, is there any way to... That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. In some universes, everything worked out just fine. And we're actually doing a live show. And in other universes, uh, I, we struggled with, with uh, technology for an hour and then had to cancel the live stream. But I think we're in the universe where it worked. So uh, I, I don't know. We're, we're in the universe where a <laughs> pandemic has happened. So, <laughs> so. True. Yeah. Yeah. Of all the universes, I think we are definitely sort of right in the middle on this one. Um, uh, so, hey, everyone, welcome to Open Space. Of course, this is my live uh, Monday live stream on my channel. And I am pleased this week to uh, welcome Dr. Kevin Peter Hand, who has written a new book about alien oceans. Uh, Kevin, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> Uh, who am I? Uh, well, so, so uh, I'll, I'll start with the basics. I'm a, yeah. a planetary scientist and astrobiologist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And uh, my focus is on the search for extant life, life that's alive today. Uh, um, and with that as my primary scientific goal, uh, these alien oceans, these oceans within uh, moons of the outer solar system like Europa, Enceladus, and Titan are my primary focus. And so I work on uh, laboratory experiments to replicate the physics and chemistry of the surfaces of these alien oceans. And I also work on missions to try and get us, uh, get some robots out to explore these these worlds in an effort to search for signs of life. I'd, I'd love to know the just like the overall, I mean, the history of this dawning on people that that these places are incredibly exciting places to search in the solar system for life. I mean, all of the attention, you know, back in the 1950s and 60s, it was Venus. Right with its with its obscuring cloud cover, and then in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, it was Mars. When yep. when did it start to dawn on people that in fact the interesting places are might be these ocean worlds? Right. Yeah. It's a it's a great question, and the um, uh, as I describe in the book, <laughs> sort of a, a convergence of various uh, factors. Um, but the the real tipping point was the Galileo mission in the late 1990s, returning data, uh, images and data about Europa that really started to help build this strong case for a subsurface salty liquid water ocean. Now, prior to that, um, the Voyager spacecraft had given us glimpses of Europa and glimpses of Enceladus. And from that imagery, the planetary scientists and astronomers uh, uh, back then around uh, the late 70s, early 90s, could see that something strange was happening on those worlds. But it would it would take until the Galileo spacecraft got out to the Jovian system in the late 90s for, um, uh, for there really to be a commanding amount of evidence supporting the, the case for a, a subsurface ocean within Europa, Ganymede, and to some extent Callisto. And so and what did Cassini, they think? Oh, sorry. So what did they think before that? Like, you know, they, they could see that there were these big moons going around Jupiter. Did they just figure they were like the moon? Like what, what did they think was going well, on? For, right. And, and so um, going back to the, to the um, Voyager mission, just prior to the arrival of Voyager at Jupiter, there was this classic planetary science paper published by Cass and Peel and Reynolds um, predicting that Io, Jupiter's innermost large moon, would be uh, incredibly, uh, would, ha would have a tremendous amount of energy being dissipated within it because of the tides that it experiences as it orbits Jupiter. And so they made this prediction and I, uh, um, it was of order weeks until the arrival of, of Galileo then happened and validated their prediction and, and sent back these images of volcanic eruptions on Io. And so um, the thinking back then and, and um, uh, uh, Peel and, and Reynolds and Cass and, uh, also published a paper on, on Europa, uh, a couple of papers. And in that work, uh, 
they said, well, if Europa is anything like Io, then there could be a fair amount of internal heating that right. who knows might support an ocean. But the, the evidence again was incredibly limited because the Voyager spacecraft, of course, just did uh, quick flybys um, and were not in orbit around Jupiter. They were just going past Jupiter on their way to the uh, uh, further reaches of the, uh, of the outer solar system. So um, it, it, it was from the 1970s and 80s on up to the late 90s when the dots could finally be connected with the Galileo spacecraft in orbit, being able to measure uh, the, the spectroscopy of the surface, being able to do the, the magnetometry uh, and coupling those measurements with the imagery. Uh, that all put the pieces together on there being this subsurface liquid water ocean. Uh, uh, and uh, apologies to everyone. I, I'm sure you've noticed there's a bit of a looks like there's a bit of a lag on uh, on Kevin's stream, and like mm -hmm. everyone is using Zoom these days, so you know that's their their entire network is entirely uh, bogged down. So I apologize. Um, okay, so so I mean at this point now the 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 overwhelming consensus is that there are these under these under ice oceans, as you said, on Europa, on on Callisto, on Ganymede, maybe some of the the other places as well. And then you were starting to say that Cassini started to pick up some additional evidence as well out in the Saturn system. That's right. And so once the Cassini spacecraft got out to Saturn and started making flybys of, uh, of Titan and Enceladus, um, well, everyone expected that that Titan would uh, um, reveal itself to be even more interesting than it already was. There were, there were um, predictions of these uh, liquid methane seas and oceans. And sure enough, the, the radar instrument on the Cassini spacecraft revealed uh, those existing. But coupled with that, as the Cassini spacecraft flew by Enceladus, it detected a perturbation in the magnetic field around Enceladus. And when it followed up its observations of that perturbation with the camera, it noticed those, uh, those amazing jets, those plumes of water erupting out of the south polar terrain of Enceladus, which uh, we now, of course, all, all know and love. And, and we have good reason to predict that they do connect to a, a salty subsurface liquid water ocean. But now the thinking really is that these things are everywhere, that they are, that there's something in Pluto, that maybe there's something on Titan, that maybe Haumea, you know, uh, that Maki Maki, like it just goes on and on. That's right. And so the, the, the big picture here is this changing of how we think about what it takes for a world to be habitable. In the early days of planetary science, we of course had this conception of the, the habitable zone as being mediated by the energy received from your parent star. Uh, and Venus, Earth, and Mars created this kind of Goldilocks scenario where uh, Venus is too close to the sun and thus too hot. Mars is too far away and thus too cold. But the Earth is at just the right Earth-Sun distance, the so-called traditional habitable zone such that it can have liquid water on the surface in contact with a nice thick atmosphere. What Europa, Enceladus, and, and these other um, alien oceans, these ocean worlds of the outer solar, solar system are teaching us, is that there's a new Goldilocks in town, and it's one wherein the energy for maintaining and sustaining liquid water in the subsurface comes not from your parent star, but rather from tidal energy and that, that stretching and tugging and, and tidal dissipation that occurs as these moons orbit their giant, prime, at their, their giant planets. And there's no better example than, of course, uh, the Jovian system where Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Right. And Europa, its nearest uh, neighbor in, uh, in the Jovian system, is just getting tugged and stretched in the seafloor of Europa. So we think the seafloor of Europa um, is likely rocky, made of silicates, similar to uh, the seafloor here on Earth. It may be that the amount of energy coming out of Europa's seafloor is between tens of milliwatts per square meter to hundreds of milliwatts per square meter. So, so put that in context. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. In Earth's ocean, on average, 
Earth's ocean has about 60 to 80 milliwatts per square meter of, right. of energy coming up. And so Europa may have an order of magnitude more energy coming out of its seafloor than, uh, than ours. Um, right. And I mean, I think like at this point, simultaneously, you've got this revolution in undersea exploration here on Earth, finding these incredible life forms clustered around these, you know, where these these uh, watts of energy are, are uh, making their way to the surface. Right. Exactly. And it's it's so uh, in the book, <laughs> um, the uh, I go through a lot of history of not just solar system exploration, but also the exploration of our ocean. Um, and uh, I, I examine kind of initially we were on parallel paths and in 1960 uh, the Navy deployed the Trieste to go down to the, yeah. to the deepest depths of the Mariana Trench. And of course that was the, the dawning of the space age too. And back then it looked like we might have a very rigorous program of exploration in, in, in both um, uh, areas. But as we know, uh, deep ocean exploration kind of trailed off and, and space exploration had a, a, a kind of heroic age that brought us through the Apollo era and uh, and I would put the Viking missions in that that same class. And then we kind of dropped off in the late 70s and 80s. And now our program of exploration through NASA is a is just a small fraction of, of what it once was. Um, and yet, both the deep ocean and the depths of space harbor answers to some of the most profound questions that humanity have ever has ever asked you know, are we alone no. uh, where did we come from where did life itself originate and is there a separate independent origin of life that has occurred elsewhere in our solar system we think that our deep ocean may have been the site of the origin of life on earth and we think that the deep oceans within europa and enceladus and these other alien oceans could perhaps have been sites where life arose on those worlds. Now you talk about, you know, about how much energy is being released down at the surface of the, of the, sort of down at the bottom of these, these under ice oceans. What does that mean for just the, for the water itself? Like just in general, because like how much overall energy would life forms have available to them compared to, what we're more familiar with in terms of say a, a you know something that's in the terrestrial zone right right so um uh, and this comes back to what uh you were alluding to at the at the beginning of your other question where um at the same time that we begin to explore the outer solar system uh with the with the voyager spacecraft and at roughly the same time that we we land the the viking spacecraft on the surface of Mars to search for life on, on that world. Humanity also makes this amazing discovery about the extremes of life on Earth. And in 1977, along the Galapagos Rift uh, in our ocean, um, the deep sea hydrothermal vents were discovered. And these hydrothermal vents, of course, are places that are cut off from sunlight and the base of the food chain down there uh, doesn't depend on photosynthesis it's driven by chemosynthesis and so when we think about the habitability of these worlds like Europa and Enceladus these deep sea hydrothermal vents in our own ocean these ecosystems where microbes are not using photosynthesis, but they're harnessing the methane and the, the sulfide and the hydrogen and other compounds coming out of hydrothermal vents. Those are interesting analogs for um, some of the chemistry that may help power biology uh, in these far and distant oceans. Uh, and so chemosynthesis might be the, uh, the predominant game in town at the base of the food chain throughout our solar system and photosynthesis uh, that we see uh, driving the food chain yeah. on the on the surface of the earth might be a, a, a minority. But it's so so. But f in terms of like pure energy density, I mean, are you getting 
the the same amount of I mean, I guess sort of where this is going is is what limits do you think there might be on life in these environments like here on the surface of Earth, the limits are really how big a thing can get until gravity pulls it over. Um, and and there's a quite a lot of energy that's being deposited. And if you put a you know, you put your whale into the ocean, then it can grow to ridiculously large sizes and, you know, yep. trees can be very big, etc you know, are, are we looking at bacterial life, little shrimps, or are, you know, c could there be a possibility of larger creatures further down the food chain in some of these, in some of these alien worlds? Right. And so, um, to be clear, the, uh, for the most part, when I talk about the search for extant living life within these alien oceans, uh, I'm referring to microbial life. And, I would be through the moon uh, if we discovered even the, the tiniest speck of life within uh, Europa or Enceladus's oceans or, or Titan's ocean, et cetera. Um, and such a discovery would revolutionize our understanding of biology. We would finally know that biology does in fact work beyond Earth. You know, we, we have yet to make that leap with biology as a science, with, with life as a phenomenon. So a microbe would make that, that transformation possible, and we would be able to see whether or not it runs on DNA, RNA, proteins. Right. All that. Are we related? Are we related, yeah. or is this an independent tree of life, an independent origin? So a microbe gets you all of that. But to your question of, let's just kind of, you know, uh, kick out some, yeah, some we're interesting just, ideas. We're just friends here. <laughs> yeah. There's nobody. There's nobody listening. Yeah, <laughs> we're just you know spitballing life just in the universe. Balling. Yeah, I got a, I got an envelope. We can do some calculations <laughs> on the back. So, uh, and I love this question. And and here again, I spend a few chapters uh, in the in the book on it. Um, and in particular, there's a there's a chapter that I uh, titled um, "The Octopus and the Hammer" mm -hmm. uh, to to get at part of this evolution of of macroscopic creatures and uh, not just the evolution of, of multicellular macroscopic life, but also what it would take for intelligence and a technologically advanced civilization to arise on an ice covered ocean world. So let's, let's take that in pieces. Um, first, getting to multicellular life. And this comes back to your question of, of energy availability. When we look at the evolution of life on Earth, it seems that one of the key drivers for the Cambrian explosion and, and the emergence of uh, large multicellular life was the availability of molecular oxygen. And that, of course, came about from photosynthesis, just pumping oxygen into the atmosphere. Eventually, the dissolved iron in our ocean rusted out and formed the banded iron formations that we now uh, see in, in cliffs and, and mines. And then we started to accumulate that molecular oxygen in the atmosphere. And O2, molecular oxygen, is very energetically useful. I like to make the analogy to batteries uh, and Microbes use all sorts of different uh, voltages and currents and different sizes of batteries. Microbes can survive off the tiniest of watch battery or, or you know, whatever the smallest battery is. That we humans and basically all animals use variations on the lead acid car battery. And that is we take oxygen from the atmosphere as the positive terminal of the biochemical battery and we combine it with carbohydrates, which are the, the negative terminal of the biochemical battery. Now, it turns out that on Europa, oxygen might be available within its ocean. And where that oxygen comes from is very intriguing. It comes from the radiation processing of Europa's surface by the electrons and ions and protons that are raining down on Europa's surface as Jupiter's magnetic field sweeps past Europa. And so you'll often hear about how harsh the radiation environment is in the Jovian system and, and the challenges that that poses for spacecraft that are heading out, heading out there. But coupled with that, the radiation 
and the surface bombardment of Europa leads to oxygen in the surface ice of Europa. We see it. We can see right. it with our telescopes. Right. And peroxide. We see. We saw that with the Galileo uh, spacecraft and sulfate. Um, and so Europa's ocean could have enough oxygen to support animals. Hmm. That, that, of course, depends on the efficiency of cycling of the surface ice with the ocean below. But I've done a lot of those calculations. And in theory, mm-hmm. you might have an ocean that's oxygenated enough. So what what has seemed like a huge detriment, the fact that, that Europa is in the midst of this enormous, very dangerous, trapped radiation field actually could benefit because it could be enriching the undersea ocean or the under ice ocean with oxygen that could be usable by animals in in larger forms but but say pluto is out of luck for that extent that's right and so um it now who knows right we're we're just humans trying to make sense of uh yeah obviously what mother nature's got going out there yeah until we send the Uh, probe to dig down through the ice to find out for sure we won't know yeah but when it comes to um ocean worlds that i think at this point in in time represent our best targets to search for extant life uh europa and enceladus rise to the top for me and then triton is a a close second or or titan is a close second um and titan also has the added uh intrigue of its bizarre methane ethane right right so it's got this additional layer on top of of these complex carbohydrate carbohydrate um hydrocarbons man uh <laughs> there you go yeah hydrocarbons that could be cycling in and out of this under you know it's like it's got this top layer of this crazy system that's all hydrocarbons and then it's got this ice layer underneath that where this material could be cycling in and out which is which is a whole with other, an ocean below that with an so ocean below that right exactly and so you could be you know and then material could coming back out from inside this so it's a pretty exciting possibility as well but but to be clear, so with with those those sort of top three candidates um, and, and differentiating from say Pluto and and, and other worlds, um, the three keystones for habitability are liquid water, uh, access to the elements needed to build life, and then access to some form of, of chemistry to power life, and that comes back to the chemosynthesis. And for these latter two points, the elements and the energy, a lot of that comes from water rock interactions. Uh, again, ocean water interacting with a with a geothermally and, and geochemically active seafloor, uh, perhaps akin to, to hydrothermal vents. On Europa and Enceladus, we think that their seafloors are rocky, and so you might have a water rock interaction that helps check the box on those additional keystones for uh, for habitability. Pluto, you know, its its density is uh, is not too bad. It may have a, a decent rock fraction, and and it could potentially have a water rock interaction occurring uh, within there. Uh, we just don't know at this stage. Um, Triton potentially also, but um, for Europa and Enceladus, I think we have enough evidence to justify going there now mm-hmm. to better understand the ocean chemistry and also to potentially. Uh, search for biosignatures. Now, you're, I mean, the observational astronomers that are going to be taking ownership of these gigantic new telescopes, like the extremely large telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope, etc., are, have this advantage that you can just point your telescope at one of these worlds from 30 light years away, detect um, the, whatever biosignatures eventually get figured out, and you get to say, okay, there's probably life on that world. Now, there's going to be a bunch of arguments, but you know, we hope that I guess by the time they actually get these telescopes operational, they'll be able to they'll be able to agree that yes, indeed, that is a biosignature. In your case, though, I mean, you can't detect these life forms without literally going for a swim. What what's it going to take? to to be able to confirm f- that that there is life in these on these worlds right so uh, let, let's be sure to, to normalize what we mean by uh, by biosignatures right and so um, when we talk about a biosignature for an exoplanet um, really what we're talking about is a spectrum of 
light from its parent star bouncing off of it and coming to us, or, or maybe it's in transmission coming through the atmosphere. Uh, and we see absorptions in um, methane and oxygen. And we then infer that, well, in an atmosphere such as we think exists on this far and distant exoplanet, um, the presence of methane and oxygen is not intrinsically stable unless you have biology maintaining that, that uh, chemical disequilibrium. Um, as amazing as a discovery like that would be, uh, that is, yeah, it's, it's not a, a yeah. surefire slam dunk of a, we found life. Uh, it's a, it's a compelling biosignature. Oh, and, and not only that, I mean, every single potential biosignature so far, uh, astrobiologists have been able to work out a, a perfectly reasonable natural methodology that those biosignatures could show up that, but I, you know, we give them 10 years, let's give them 20 years. Hopefully they'll find something that they can what, what, hang their hat on, right? Right. Well, hopefully. hopefully. Uh, so so my, dr my, my dream of dreams is that uh, we continue to make these amazing exoplanet discoveries and we follow them up with targeted SETI searches mm -hmm. in the radio and in the optical. And, uh, and someday we find that, um, that incredible uh, actual signal coming to us, which um, then there's no doubt uh, once we start – you know, getting pie streamed to us, uh, uh, it's, yeah. it's off to the races. Uh, sure. But uh, it, but just coming to the issue of what it means to find a biosignature on, say, Mars or Europa or mm -hmm. Enceladus or Titan. Now we're talking about landing robotic spacecraft that will not make just one biosignature measurement. They will make a multitude of measurements many of which are complementary uh, and, uh, and redundant. So uh, if you see, for example, complex organics that might hint at, uh, at life with a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, you then take a look at that material with a Raman spectrometer and corroborate that GCMS result. Um, or you see the organics and you now have a chemical sign of life and you want to cross check that with a, mm -hmm. a morphologic biosignature. You want to actually see if there are cellular compartments, if there are the structures of life. And so, you know, when we talk about the search for life on Mars or Europa, Enceladus, et cetera, we're talking about a multitude of measurements that would uh, give us a uh, a, a an array of evidence supporting uh, the, the determination of whether or not we've actually found found life. Mm -hmm. uh, life detection requires not just one biosignature, but many complementary and redundant biosignature measurements. Unless you see a, a European space whale uh, breach the 100%. surface of the ice and, you know, and reach you out. Catch and catch that little krill. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, uh, grab your probe with its with its uh, tentacles and drag it underneath, and then you go a long right. way. Yeah, but I, I think that's, that's important is that, you know, we went through the Viking lander situation where they landed on they landed on Mars they said that's it we found life look at that then they argued for 20 years and NASA did almost like a hard reset on the search for life and was a lot more careful and disciplined about let's search for evidence of past water let's set search for evidence of, you know, building a, for the precursors of life and various chemicals. Do you see that same, you know, I'm assuming that lesson's been learned at NASA. Um, and so you see that same process is now happening with Europa and Enceladus, et cetera. Build up the 100%. case. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 100%. And so uh, um, I can uh, direct your, your viewers and listeners to... Um, to Google Europa Lander Science Definition Team Report 2016, and you'll get to a several hundred page document that I uh, helped to uh, uh, co-chair. And in there, you'll, uh, uh, hopefully it's a fun read. Uh, it was uh, a lot of teamwork in, in writing that document. But we've got a whole chapter on lessons learned from Viking, and, and uh, I go through a bunch of that history in the book. Um, and 
the goal with um, with landing on an uh, on an ice covered ocean world uh, uh, to search for life within an alien ocean would be to follow on say the Europa Clipper mission, which is assessing the habitability of Europa, um, and the the measurements. So so let me back up uh, a bit. The Viking missions sometimes get a an unfair shake, in my opinion, in that uh, um, I say, well, there is all this debate about um, whether or not the Viking missions found life, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. The Viking missions did not find life. Um, uh, Gil Levin and others may debate that, but by the standard of having numerous biosignatures that can corroborate each other and build a robust case for uh, for life detection. Uh, Viking definitively did not find evidence of, of, uh, of life. And the GCMS, the gas chromatograph on the Viking mission is largely what, uh, um, what eliminated that, that possibility. Uh, the Viking mission did not find organics at a level of, of parts per billion in the samples that it that it analyzed. Uh, now that said, the Viking missions were an incredible achievement for the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and th if there was a if there was a sort of um, uh, failing of the Viking mission, it's that the biology payload, the biology investigations were primarily targeted at living life, at finding life that the spacecraft could culture. Mm -hmm. I, think about this. This is 1977. I know, I know, I know. It, and there, there's, there's a spacecraft on Mars that's dropping soil into agar and, and waiting for microbes to grow. Uh, it, it was a tremendous achievement. But that was before we had, uh, you know, it was it was a year later when Archaea, the third major domain of life, was discovered. Uh, it wouldn't be another. Uh, it wasn't until what was it in 1980? Again, I've got this in the book. When PCR, polymerase chain reaction, uh, uh, and that methodology for for analyzing the the, the DNA of an organism uh, really truly uh, came online and. and full force um and so the the viking missions were well ahead of their time uh and we did learn a lot of lessons and one of the main lessons is simply to um to look for the relics of dead organisms and to do it in a multitude of ways right to look for the organics uh to look for the structures of life to look for the or inorganic materials uh and i think we are now in a position where in the coming decade if NASA so chooses, and if the taxpayers desire, we could move forward with landing a spacecraft on the surface of Europa uh, and a similar spacecraft on the surface of Enceladus to, uh, to search for signs of life. And oh, by the way, do incredible science mm -hmm. on comparative oceanography. Uh, how amazing is it that we now know of oceans existing beyond Earth? Yeah. Life aside, the, the prospect of understanding oceans as a planetary process is, uh, I, I think, inv uh, very exciting. And, and one of the calculations that I had seen was that they're, they're like a factor of a thousand more common potentially than habitable, you know, terrestrial planets in the habitable zone, that there is a lot of them out there, that this is a very common structure out there. That that's probably true. We, um, I, you know, I, I, I treat those numbers with caution. The the so-called exo moons and all that. Yeah. Um, if our solar system is any guide, then yes, uh, uh, Europa's should be ubiquitous. Yeah. And the um, the bulk habitable real estate in our universe may well be subsurface liquid water oceans. Um, and again, that's with a sample size of one, our own solar system. Uh, but you know, there's good reason to think that that uh, 
these distant exoplanets probably have exomoons and some of yeah. those exomoons could well be ice covered ocean worlds. Well, I don't want to keep hogging your time. So I'm going to uh, pass along some of the questions to uh, some of the audience as well. So Arjone is asking, would they dig into the ocean of Enceladus through the tiger stripes or would they like to leave them alone? And I guess the question is, do Europa and Enceladus offer you some places that could maybe give you a a an easier place to search for life than just you know some random spot on the surface yeah this is uh, arjan you said yeah. uh yeah. Was the uh, listener yeah this is a great question and really what it comes down to is planetary protection and i um uh uh am a firm uh europophile encelidophile titanophile um if there is indeed life within the oceans of these worlds, I want to be sure that we do everything in our power to protect that life. And so um, just as one example, um, on our Europa lander mission concept, one of the modalities that we looked at for planetary protection uh, was uh, in a partnership with the Sandia National Laboratories. My colleagues there are doing wonderful work. Um, and. Uh, we, we had this mechanism that I like to call the, the Mission Impossible button, which is that at the end of life of the Europa Lander mission concept, uh, the last, the very, very last thing that the spacecraft would do is send a, a command to hit the self uh, incinerate button and it would <laughs> ignite this, this block of thermite that would uh, heat the spacecraft um to many hundreds to uh i think it was 1200 degrees uh, celsius uh and sterilize anything uh, on the spacecraft to make sure that in the off chance that a uh, fracture opens and gobbles up the spacecraft there's no microbes to yeah. then uh, uh contaminate the the ocean although i've and heard so the surface world, of jupiter itself is is pretty extreme like if you're on the surface of europa in that trap magnetic field you're you're getting a nice sterilization bath already Exactly. And, and that's where um, uh, with Europa lander mission concept, the uh, here again, the radiation is uh, on the one hand, it's a pain in the neck to deal with. On the other hand, it's uh, liberating uh, in that, yeah, you have to have rad hard electronics and and, um, uh, and your spacecraft is going to deal with, um, uh, with the, the rain of radiation. But the upshot is that... Um, once your mission's over, the the radiation sterilizes your spacecraft. And we've got a lot of work going on looking at uh, the extent to which we can utilize that kind yeah. of environmental attribute as a way to uh, to help with the planetary protection. But assuming that, I, you know, the, but assuming that the, the planetary protection issues were, you felt were acceptable, would you go down into those tiger stripes? Like, is that the place you'd want to look? Right, and so the South Pole of Enceladus is obviously where we would love to send a lander. Um, and I think we could do it, but there you are actually directly going to a place where um, uh, you see geologic activity today. And, uh, and so the, the requirements for landing in the South Pole of Enceladus um, are, are perhaps prohibitive. Um, we don't yet know that's, uh, that's some of the work that uh, our team and various other teams are looking at is, uh, you know, how close to a fissure could you land just from an engineering technical challenge standpoint? Uh, you know, you don't want to be coming in with a sky crane like mechanism and have your camera get all fogged up by uh, um, <laughs> or, or messed up by uh, particles from a plume. Uh, so there's that to consider. But coupled with that, you have to consider what if the system fails as I'm coming in for a landing and we accidentally drop this thing off down a fissure. Uh, is that acceptable? Um, right. And we, we don't yet know the answer to that. Uh, yeah. Right now, the, well, right now the answer would be no, that's not acceptable. Right. Uh, but uh, um, it's it's part of the path forward right. for exploring these alien oceans. Yeah, it's like, what a surprise. You know, we found methanogens, and then we looked over there and we found methanogens, right. and then we dug under that and we found methanogens. What a surprise. Everywhere we look, we find methanogens. <laughs> we and... found our own little hitchhikers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they're doing just fine here. Um, uh, let's see, let me get another question here. Um, so Simon Farmer asks, how does an ocean world fare under the powerful UV flares of a red dwarf? 
So we talk about how awful these these M dwarf stars are because in, early on in their history, they have these nightmarish flares that are hundreds of thousands of times more powerful than the kind of flares that the sun can give off. But do we see some level of protection for you know if you have one of these ice worlds on a around an M dwarf? Yeah, that, that's a great question, uh, and and not. Um... Uh, one that I've given a, a, a tremendous amount of thought in terms of, of doing the calculations, but um, uh, think of it, uh, it this way. Um, one of the mechanisms for shielding astronauts that's long been considered for, say, going to, to Mars or elsewhere is just to put all of the water around the perimeter of the spacecraft, and water serves as a relatively good shield for uh, various types of radiation. And on top of that, salt water uh, uh, salt is also a relatively good um, absorber, and, and um, uh, it's got good stopping power for, for various um, uh, types of radiation. And so within a salty, ice-covered alien ocean, um, you might have enhanced protection uh, in that kind of system relative to an Earth-like world where now all of a sudden you're, um, you're Proto dinosaurs uh, have got uh, unmanageable genetic mutations because they've been blasted for such a long time. Um, it's so, I mean, I know that if you like go a couple of meters even underneath the ice on Europa, you're probably protected. Like if you want to build a base, a research base, just dig under a couple of meters under the ice and you're completely protected from Jupiter's trap radiation and cosmic radiation. Thanks yeah, the. To- the- a, a few meters would would do you well. Um, you would uh, so, so an intriguing aspect of Europa's surface is that we actually see salt deposits on Europa's surface, and salts are pretty dense, and density uh, um, is important when it comes to the stopping power. You know how effective a material is at providing radiation shielding, and so if I actually wanted to send astronauts to the the surface of Europa. Uh, I, I would have them build a little um, salt shed. Uh, <laughs> a salt <laughs> uh, igloo. They, exactly. Yeah. And then uh, get down in to the ice. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Aaron's asked, is the Europa Ocean salt water or fresh? It, it's salt water. And the, the way we know that primarily um, is through the induced magnetic field measurement that was made uh, by the magnetometer on the Galileo spacecraft. Um, and uh, here again, got a chapter about that in the book. Um, and in there, I also tell the story of um, the uh, amazing scientist, Margaret Kevelson, who was a professor at, at UCLA, and how she and her team made that measurement of the induced magnetic field around Europa and were able to attribute that field, uh, that magnetic field, that induced magnetic field, to a salty subsurface liquid water ocean. Um, And that chapter is titled, Adhering to Airport Security. (laughs) Uh, And the the reason I I titled it that is because the physics, and it's just beautiful physics, all of these aspects of of how we came to know that Europa's ocean exists, uh, it's just, it's physics 101. uh, and uh, and the induced magnetic field is uh, the detection of the induced magnetic field around Europa is basically the same physics as what happens when you walk through an airport security doorway. Um, you know, not one of those big cylinders that we now have. Right, to right, with. but the one that's <laughs> but, check, but you the, know that catches your belt. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, that you're walking through a time varying magnetic field, the DBDT, uh, and Faraday and Maxwell told us that if you've got a conductor in a, in a DBDT, that gives rise to a, an induced electric field, which gives rise to an induced uh, magnetic field. And within the doorway are little sensors that can uh, detect that induced magnetic field occurring within a conductor in your belt or in your pocket. And the alarm goes off and then you get pulled to the side and patted down and you miss your flight. Um, well, when the Galileo spacecraft flew by Europa, it detected um, not an intrinsic field around Europa, but rather an induced field that was arising in direct response to the time-varying field, the DBDT, of Jupiter, 
uh, as Jupiter rotates once every 10 hours or 11 hours synodic relative to Europa, uh, and Jupiter's magnetic field is tilted by almost 10 degrees relative to the rotation axis of Jupiter. Uh, and so there is this time variant component. Wow. And in this, uh, I know I'm breezing through this quickly, a lot of details yeah, yeah. in the yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in this analogy, Jupiter and its magnetic field are like the airport security doorway. You with your belt are like Europa. And then the alarm system is like the Galileo spacecraft flying by right. Europa, detecting that induced magnetic field, that field arising from a, a conductor in your pocket. And what was in Europa's pocket, the best explanation for why the alarm went off and what's in Europa's pocket is a salty near surface liquid water ocean. And Beautiful did, physics. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, did we see something similar with Enceladus? Like, no, yeah, uh, it, it, it's a great question, uh, Fraser. And the, the, um, uh, so Saturn's magnetic field is co aligned with its rotation axis. And so you don't get that same DBDT. Mm. Um, now, there is a, an eccentricity component that gives you a, um, a spatial DBDT. In other words, uh, as Enceladus orbits Saturn, it moves closer and further away from Saturn. And as a result, it is physically moving through the field and you get a time varying component from that. Sa same with Europa. Um, the Galileo spacecraft didn't have a high enough cadence of flybys around Europa where those kinds of measurements were were able to be made. But when we get back out there with the Europa Clipper mission, we'll certainly make those uh, uh, measurements of the of that uh, of that component of the induced magnetic field. And, um, and so what the Cassini magnetometer was able to do, however, was to detect a disturbance around in uh, sorry, did I say Europa there? And I, no, until it if is. I, if, yeah. I, I, okay, sometimes I you know, flip the E's. Yeah. Uh, so with Cassini at Enceladus, the magnetometer was actually the first um, sign that something strange was going on at Enceladus. When, uh, uh, when the Cassini spacecraft flew by the South Pole, a perturbation akin to a, a plasma disturbance was detected around the South Pole of Enceladus. And Christian Karana and others, um, uh, uh, um, Doherty, Kievelson, all sorts of amazing colleagues uh, did this work where um, they looked at that disturbance and said, huh, how could you possibly explain that kind of perturbation around the South Pole of Enceladus? I said, well, maybe there's something erupting out of that region. And sure enough, when uh, the Cassini spacecraft was aligned, so as to get sunlight reflecting off the South Polar terrain, Carolyn Porco and team were able to see those jets of water erupting mm -hmm. out of the out of the South Pole. That, that iconic image that we now have of uh, of Enceladus's uh, South Polar terrain. So, I got a question from Paul Thacker, um, which is: uh, Would we need to choose a landing site for a Europa lander ahead of time, or could we wait until we got there and map it better before sending it down? And I, I, I'm I forget where we're at on the. Clipper gets a lander, doesn't get a lander continuum here. Which universe we're in on that one? Um, right. You know, yeah. Do, so oh, do you ahead. map it out? Well, I was going to say, do you do you take a lander with you, map out Europa, and when the time is right, drop it down? Or do you map it out now and then send a lander afterwards? And and where are we at on that on that decision? Right. Uh, uh, it's a great question. And it's one that's near and dear to my heart. Part of what I do at JPL and part of what I've been working on for many, many years now is uh, trying to get a lander to the surface of Europa. And uh, NASA currently has no commitment to, uh, to landing on Europa. The Europa Clipper mission is a flyby mission. It's an amazing mission. It'll, it will orbit Jupiter and make some 45 plus flybys of Europa, but it is not carrying a lander or any other um, type of vehicle that would get down to the, the surface of Europa. There's no impactor, there's no penetrator, no soft lander. Uh, for a number of years, we were on track to have one, but, uh, but then um, the decision was made to, to not do that. Um, and uh, that's way above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> but, the, uh, uh, but the mission concept that we did have uh, up until a few years ago, and, and we're still carrying that, that mission concept, uh, even though we're, we're kind of in, in limbo right now, um, is that we would launch a lander 
a couple of years after mm -hmm. the Clipper mission launches. And that's very attractive for a number of reasons. Um, first and foremost, you get out to Europa with the Clipper mission and you now have a number of years, uh, two years at least, it actually ends up being closer to three or four years uh, because the lander mission needs to spend some time pinballing around the Jovian system before it can actually get in and land. So you've got at least two years, possibly three, four, five years when you can be looking at the Europa Clipper data and selecting a landing site that's both very scientifically interesting and uh, satisfies your, your engineering requirements uh, before you spin down in that final approach to land on Europa's surface. And you might say, okay, well, well, that makes sense. You can, you can select a, a scientifically interesting landing site based on the Clipper data, but don't you need to get the data back from the Clipper mission before you can even design a land? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, and the answer to that is, is no, uh, because the Clipper mission, as amazing as it is, only carries a camera that, um, that provides a, an image resolution of about half meter per pixel at the best. And that's great. And that's going to be uh, a, a, a um, uh, just a, a jaw dropping yeah. data set. I mean, that's uh, the same kind of resolution we've got of the moon and Mars. So that's pretty good. And, and the, um, the key thing to appreciate here is that um, the spacecraft, uh, our spacecraft are of order meter to a couple meters in spatial extent in, in diameter. And so really to design a spacecraft where you could know that every nuance of the surface is going to be A-OK -okay, uh, for your spacecraft, you would need centimeter to decimeter scale resolution on your camera. And we don't have that with the right. Europa Clipper mission. So we're never going to land on Europa uh, if that is your requirement. Now, thankfully, engineers, I would argue, are often a lot more are a lot brighter than scientists and my uh my colleagues at jpl who have designed landers that get to the surface of mars and other worlds they have a long track record of landing on unknown surfaces yeah osiris and, rex at Bennu right now is a textbook example of of a landing situation that nobody anticipated and, and we have um, it's only with MSL really where we have truly had imagery prior to landing that was at the decimeter scale. Um, you know, you look at Viking, you look at Mer, you look at uh, Pathfinder, um, uh, Phoenix, uh, all of these missions. Um, you, you know, you did not have imagery at the uh, subspacecraft scale to precisely determine um, the, the technical safety. So what we've done with Europa Lander mission concept is that we come in with sort of a, a smaller version of the sky crane that was used for MSL. And we have terrain relative navigation and hazard avoidance uh, that helps us avoid fractures and cliffs and cracks. Um, and so we'll have a base map that comes from the clipper uh, imagery. But then once the spacecraft descends beyond the resolution of that imagery, it's got the onboard intelligent, intelligence right. uh, at the uh, five centimeter scale, I think is the latest number on that, on the LIDAR resolution and, and some of the imagery resolution, where it will do that hazard avoidance uh, and um, intelligent landing uh, on its own. And we're testing out a lot of those technologies uh, on the next Mars mission on Mars 2020. Right. Um, I mean, do you so, have the, uh, sorry, do you have, I mean, do you have the same situation like with Osiris Rex and Bennu? I mean, the spacecraft has mapped, it mapped it from a fairly high altitude. We learned just how boulder strewn that place is, but then I, it's been doing, and in fact, a bunch of the people that are watching the show helped up map the, uh, all of these boulders. Um, but, oh, that's great. but but then, um, you know, getting closer and closer and closer. And now I know just a couple of days ago, it did like a 75 meter flyby. So do you have that same kind of control that you can, you can take some lander mission into closer and closer, you know, but, or is the gravity field of Europa say a lot more difficult to try to spend long periods of time around? 
Right, right. So the, the OSIRIS Rex mission has a much um, uh, kind of older version of, uh, of touch and go. And so uh, it needs a lot more joysticking. Um, what, uh, what MSL and Mars 2020 and hopefully uh, a Europa lander uh, would utilize is that terrain relative nav navigation uh, coupled with hazard avoidance uh, where it's just coming in. And then the final stage is that, um, and, and you, can, you can see a, a highly um, uh, technically informed animation of this on YouTube if you Google Europa lander mission concept. Um, and uh, Cynthia Phillips posted this a number of years ago. She's she's a uh, the deputy pre-project scientist. Yeah, I think we've team. used it a couple of times in some of our videos. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 So so you see that there are these grasshopper legs that accommodate obstacles on the uh, on the meter to submeter scale, uh, and a lot of our technical development has or was validated by the selection of the of the Dragonfly spacecraft that will go out to to Titan, uh, and so. The, um, uh, the selection of that spacecraft in many ways gives us the green light for our technical mm -hmm. approach to, to landing on Europa. It's kind of incredible how these technologies developed for smartphones or developed for drones or things like that are going to have all of these applications. I mean, the level of autonomy that you could send a spacecraft with some kind of machine learning or whatever to do collision avoidance and navigation and complete autonomous that far away it would have been unthinkable 10 years ago. And yet here we are, it feels almost, you know, if it can, you know, generate pictures of, you know, we can generate pictures of cats and do deep fakes and all this kind of stuff that, that in fact, maybe we could uh, have a spacecraft maneuver itself around. Well, we're, we're reaching the end of, of our time. Uh, before we do uh, place your bets, uh, Mars or one of the ocean worlds, where do we find life first? Um, well, so the, when it comes to extant life, uh, life where we could hope to someday, someday look at its biochemistry, uh, I think that is going to be uh, Europa or Enceladus, um, possibly uh, Titan, depending on how generous the liquid water ocean uh, beneath uh, Titan's all right. Crust is um, Mars. Uh, we might find signs of life, but it's going to be uh, the the broken up lipids of, of ancient life on Mars, and it's going to take a um, uh, a much more rigorous program of exploration right. to to see whether or not it's connected to our tree of life. Fantastic. Uh, well, the book is Alien Oceans. Uh, if people want to follow your work uh, and sort of keep track of the of the missions and the state of Clipper and what comes after, where should they go? Uh, well, so my tag or whatever on Twitter and all that is at Alien Oceans uh, on Twitter and, and uh, Kevin underscore Peter underscore hand on Instagram. Uh, I don't do much on social media. I'm trying to get better. About it, but the, uh, it's all right. I, uh, I would then, much rather you worked on spacecraft than got good on social media. So I'll, yeah, I'll, so. I'll help you communicate what you're doing on, you know, out to social media and you work on actually uh, discovering things. Excellent. And the, yeah, I hope you all enjoy the book. Yeah, this is, this is, this is my, this is my 120 character solution uh, to social media. So, <laughs> so I, I, I need your help getting the word out. Yeah. Uh, good reviews and uh, all that fun stuff. Uh, it's been a challenge trying to get the word out during a pandemic. And I hope everybody out there is healthy and uh, yeah. uh, safe and doing well and hanging in there. Well, I, it, it's a great book. I really enjoyed it. And this is a, this is a topic that we have covered many times in the past on my channel. And I'm sure we're going to be covering it many times in the future. And it was great to see just from the cutting edge, which is like, like not the, not the stuff that would have come out in 1981 with cosmos, but the stuff that's happening right now, which is the current thinking about the state for, of, of the search for life in the, in the solar system. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Uh, Kevin, uh, thank you so much for both doing your work and writing the book and, uh, showing up here on our channel. I really appreciate it. Uh, a big thank you, of course, to all of everyone who watched today, all of our moderators, all of the people both on YouTube and Twitch who were watching us today. Uh, thanks for hanging out and we'll see all of you next week. Thanks so much.